We're in uh, Brother Mark, I believe it was last week, finished uh, 1 Timothy out for us, chapter 6. And um, so we're going to move on in to chapter, uh, excuse me, chapter 1 of 2 Timothy and go from there. And I may share, go into some other scripture. I usually don't go into other scripture very much. I usually just stick to the chapter we're on, but this one goes into Romans 8, and Romans 8 is really good, so it's hard to teach a lesson that references it without going into it because uh, it's an awesome little chapter there. Um, but let's just get started. It says, 2 Timothy chapter, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse number 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Timothy wasn't actually Paul's son, but he was in the spiritual spectrum of the thing. And uh, that's what Paul considered uh, Timothy as a son. And he said, grace, mercy, and peace. I, I've, I mentioned before one time when I was teaching one of Paul's books that Paul usually starts and sometimes finishes his books speaking about the grace of God. Because to Paul, that was the most important thing that a believer can ha get a hold of and have a revelation of. Because without the grace of God working in our lives, none of these things that Paul taught, none of these things that... Paul gave to these other churches. None of that is possible without the grace of God working in his life. And it's the same for us today. We're not any more special or any more whatever than Paul and Timothy and the others were. We also have to have the grace of God working in our lives. And all of that comes from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And it's all made possible by the work that God, Christ did on the cross. Beginning of, or going on to verse number three, it says, I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of you in my prayers night and day. The first part of this verse, uh, Paul, when he began, uh, when he was a, uh, what was he? Pharisee. Thank you, a Pharisee. <laughs> Completely left my mind. When Paul was a uh, Pharisee, the things that Paul did, he did from a pure conscience because he believed that's what he was supposed to be doing. And he, wasn't, he was a believer of God. He just didn't have the revelation of the cross. And the things that he did, he says here, I did of a pure conscience from my forefathers. Back, when, I mean, his forefathers. If you're a Pharisee, typically, isn't it? It's, from, it's a lineage thing. Is that right? Am I right in that? Okay, I thought it was. Uh, it's a lineage thing. So his forefathers, all the way up to him, were Pharisees. And what he did, he did of a pure conscience. And then he goes on to say, Without ceasing, I have remembrance of you in my prayers night and day. That, uh, it, the notes say that it gives it see, that we can see a depth of this man's prayer life. Paul was a prayer. Jesus was a prayer. Jesus would go up on a mountaintop alone to pray. And Jesus is the Son of God. And if the Son of God had to have time alone to pray. If Paul, one of the greatest apostles that's ever walked the face of the earth, had to pray, what am I to think that I can get by without it? You know, prayer, I, I, I work in a public setting now, and not everybody shares my beliefs. <laughs> and um, there... Uh, was a gentleman come in talking to one of my co-workers and he was very vehemently bashing Christianity. I was working. I was shelving books. I didn't get involved in the conversation. Some things you just don't need to involve yourself in. I don't need to defend Jesus. Um, so I just stayed out of it. She told me on the way out she said, I apologize for the things that he said because he was very rude of the way you believe. She's not a Christian either, but she doesn't bash Christianity. And I said, I called her name. I'm not going to call her name. But uh, 
I said, if my Christianity is based upon what he said, then I don't really, I'm not really a Christian. I said, it's based on relationship, not what other people say about my God. And that's what prayer is. Prayer develops a relationship. It's just like in a marriage. If you don't ever talk to your spouse, you don't have a relationship. You have an acquaintance. You live with an acquaintance. And it's the same way with Jesus. If we don't talk to him, and I'm not saying I'm, I do it right. I, I'm just saying I know that if I don't spend time with him, I don't have a relationship with him. I become an acquaintance of his. I know him. I know of him. I know what the Bible says about him. I know what other people say about him, but I don't know him. I don't have that relationship with him. So in order to develop that relationship, I have to spend time with him. I have to pray. I have to seek his face. I have to depend upon his grace. Without that, I am nothing. And that's what Paul, that's what Jesus knew. That's what Paul knew. And it says that he, he uh, had remembrance of Timothy in his prayers night and day. Timothy was a Christian. Timothy, Paul had poured into Timothy. Timothy had received the revelation of the cross. Timothy was a Christian, and, but Paul prayed for him night and day, the scripture says. It's very important that we pray for people. <laughs> yes. Amen. Amen. It's so important that we pray for people. Yes. Yes. You know, don't, yeah, exactly, don't take for granted that somebody else is doing it. And if it's your family, you better be praying for your family because if you're not praying for your family, there's nobody on this earth that's going to pray for your family like you do. Right. Nobody else knows your family like you do. Nobody else can, can intercede for your family like you I, I mean, I say that. I know that God can do anything and bring in somebody into their lives. I know that. But you're the mama. You're the daddy. You're the grandparent. You're the aunt. You're the uncle. You're the whatever. We need to be praying, and I'm saying we because I need to do this as well. We need to be praying for our families. You know, I pray for Becca and Aaron. On a, you know, and I pray for Matthew and Ashley, and I pray for my grandkids, and I pray for John David, and I pray for my husband, and I, I pray for my family. And I'm, I'm not saying that's why God protected him, but I believe it had a part in it. I believe it had a part in it. We do love our family more than anybody else, even with their faults. <laughs> you know, I can, I can love my husband despite his... He can love me despite my faults. Good grief. <laughs> um, I love my kids despite the fact that they walk on my, my heart sometimes. We need to pray. God, forgive me for the times that I've been slack. I don't know why I'm staying here. I didn't really intend to stay here. I thought you were getting up to come. I was like, okay, good. <laughs> I have to shift my weight too sometimes. You put it all in one spot, it hurts after a while. Um, but prayer is so, so important. God, forgive me for the times that I didn't consider it as important as it is. Not only does it re uh, develop a relationship for me, but you know what? It affects my family. I don't know. I... Nothing else can take its place. No, exactly. Nothing, nothing else can take the place of a prayer life. Uh, let me just move on. I, I don't... Um, I don't feel led to say much more. So, But it says uh, that without ceasing I have remembrance of you in my prayers night and day. 
greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with great with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in you also. Uh, Paul, Timothy was there. This note say that Timothy was probably there when Paul was arrested the second time and transported to Rome for his final imprisonment. So Timothy saw, which, and, and I believe that maybe Timothy was not struggling in, uh, you know, like deciding to give up. I'm not saying that. But from the context of some of the scripture that goes in, that's in this chapter, I believe that maybe Timmy, Timmy, <laughs> thinking of Air, uh, Dice Boy, uh, I believe, I'm <laughs> just real familiar with old Timothy there. I believe that maybe uh, Timothy was, um, I don't know how to word it, but you know, the verse number seven talks about God's not giving him a spirit of fear. I believe that because Timothy saw what happened to Paul, maybe Timothy was a little on the cautious side and maybe a little worried that this might you know, occur and happen to him. So Paul is reassuring him that I'm praying for you night and day. And I have seen what came down through your heritage. You know, he, he started out talking about how he served God with a pure conscience, but then he moves into Timothy's family, and he says, your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm persuaded is in you also. What a heritage. You know, this is something that has been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And it is the most important thing that can be passed down from generation to generation to generation. It doesn't matter how much money I pass down to my kids, which by the way is not anything. Doesn't matter how much, you know, if I leave them a, you know, this great big beautiful home or this nice car, none of that matters. That's not a heritage. That's an inheritance that they may receive, but it's not a heritage. My faith that I have in Jesus Christ, if I can manage to, to pass that down to my kids and then on to my grandkids, that's what a heritage is. That is the most important thing in the world. Some of you are raising little bitty kids. You know, that's more important than a ball game. That's more important than watching SpongeBob SquarePants. Uh, you know, that is more important than anything. That's more important than game night. Amen. That's right. You know, that's right. I hear all the time at my job about how, you know, got to have my kids busy. Got to, you know, keep them busy, keep them busy, keep them busy. I don't think keeping them busy is always the answer. You know, sometimes they can be busy in the wrong stuff. I believe having time together, and I'm not saying I did it right all the time, but I believe having time together as a family, sitting down with your kids at night before they go to bed and praying over them. I remember kneeling down by my, my kids' beds or sitting on the bed while they knelt, and we prayed together every night. When we were in the car on the way to school every morning, we prayed. I would pray. They would pray. We would pray. Those are precious, sweet times, <laughs> sweet memories. And it's the most important thing that they can have. And I, my kids haven't always done everything right. But you know what they go, you know who they go to when they know that, you know, something's going wrong in their life? You know what they fall back on? They fall back on that. They know that their answer is not in this world. They know where their, their, their hope is. Doesn't mean they always live it. Doesn't mean I always live it. I mess up too. But they know where their hope is at. That's the most important thing that we can pass down. When I die, when I'm in my, my coffin and they're getting ready to put me in the ground, I hope that my kids look at me and say, she told me about Jesus. I don't want them to say what a great person I was. I could care less. I don't want them to say, oh, I got all mama's nice jewelry. Don't have any, but I don't want them to say that. I don't want them to say, you know, that she left us a nice house. When I go, I want them to say, she taught me about Jesus. 
She taught me what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. That's what I want my legacy to be. That's what I want to leave them. That's the most important thing. Um, before I go any further in this chapter, I do want to flip over to uh, uh, Romans, yeah, Romans chapter 8. And because the rest of this, cha- not the rest, but part of this chapter, or most of this chapter, deals with Paul giving Timothy a charge. Now, he does remind Timothy in, in this passage that it all comes from Jesus and the Holy Spirit living within him. But I want to go back to Romans 8 because Brother Swigert's notes kind of refer back to that. And Romans chapter 8 deals with the fact that there's only one way to truly be able to live a victorious life, to please Jesus, and it's through the Spirit and not through the flesh. And I'm just going to begin in verse number 1. Romans chapter 8, verse number 1 says, There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus is the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that is the only thing that is stronger than the law of sin and death. The only thing. My flesh is not stronger than that I can't defeat Satan. In fact, I'm not called to defeat Satan. Brother Mark spoke last week on the fact that we are to fight the good fight of faith. That is the only fight that I'm required to fight. That's the only place in Scripture you'll see that it tells us that we're supposed to fight. I'm not supposed to fight the devil. Amen. I'm not supposed to fight, you know, my battles. I'm, he, that my battles have already been fought. The battle has already been won. My battle is faith. And the reason that it's a battle is because that's what Satan is constantly attacking. Satan is not attacking me personally. Satan is not attacking my family personally. Satan is attacking my faith. Because he knows that if he can move my faith from Jesus Christ and Him crucified to any other source, if I make anything else my source, if I make my family my source, if I make my money my source, if I make my home, my vehicle, my circumstances, if I make myself my source, if I make one of you my source, then He's defeated me. That's why fighting the good fight of faith is a fight. Because as soon, he knows as soon as he can move my faith, he's got me right where he wants me. But if I keep my faith focused on Jesus Christ and him crucified, I'm free from the law of sin and death. And everything else was provided at the cross too. Not just victory from sin. And that's a great victory. But deliverance, healing, health to my body, all of that, grace, peace, love, joy, all these commandments that we're supposed to follow, all of it was provided at the cross. And when I keep my faith completely and totally in that, then I am living by the Spirit. And when I live by the Spirit, then I'm free from the law of sin and death. Verse number 3 says, For the, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. The law couldn't do it. The law was weak. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not blah. Do not whatever. All, you know, the law is weak. The law, it's like, you know, when I have a mirror in front of my face, I can see my flaws, but the mirror does nothing to help me correct my flaws. I can't take that mirror and rub it on my face and not have a pimple anymore. Doesn't work that way. The law is the same way. The law shows me my flaws, but the law could not correct my flaws. I can't, the law doesn't do anything. It's weak. But, it says, it's through the flesh. flesh. Exactly. But it says, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemn sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit 
For they who are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they who are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So many people are looking for peace. Everybody's looking for peace. Everybody's looking for a great life. It's all found in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. My carnal mind, my flesh, me trying to live for God by my own ability is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh, listen to this, do you want to please God? Amen. It says the ones in the flesh cannot please God. I can't please God by my flesh. Amen. The scripture says in Hebrews 11, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. If I don't have faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified and the work that He did on the cross, I can't please God. I can't be kind to you. I can't love you. I can't be joyful. I can't have peace. I can't not sin. It's all impossible. The scripture says, I can't please God. Why do I try? I sound very country right now. I'm hearing myself. Why do I try? Why do I try to please God? I can't. It is a trick of the devil. He is attacking my faith. He's trying to move my faith. Listen to this next verse. It says, but you are not in the flesh. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Spirit of the living God lives in you. And as long as your faith is placed in Him, you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ... He is none of His. The Paul is saying that the work of the Spirit in our lives is made possible by what Christ did at Calvary. Right. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he who raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are, not, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. When I place my faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified, it gives the Holy Spirit the latitude to work in my life and do all the things that God has commanded me to do. That's what grace is. That's what grace is. That's what Paul started out saying. That also brings peace. And uh, mercy. That's what Paul started out with. I thought it was life, but it's mercy. That's what Paul started out with this in this. But it's only, it's only as I look to Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Because when I do that, it gives the, power, the Holy Spirit the power to work in my life. And enable me to do those things that God has commanded me to do. And that He expects me to do. But in my flesh, I can't do. Back to 2 Timothy. We're going now into the charge that Timothy gave Paul. And the reason I went to that passage is because without understanding that it's through the Spirit and through my faith in Jesus Christ, I can't, Paul, Timothy couldn't follow this charge, and neither can I. I can't follow this charge if I don't understand what the Spirit of God can do in my life by my placing my faith in Jesus. It says, Wherefore I put you in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God. Paul is te telling him, you know, he sees the faith that he has. He says, now I'm going to put you in remembrance of the, uh, uh, the, that you stir up the gift of God, which is in you by the putting on of my hands. Doesn't mean that Paul bestowed this gift, but that he verified that he knew that it was already there. The gift was from God. 
The gift to preach was from God, but Paul laid hands on him and, and prayed for him in that sense is what it's saying. Verse number seven, and this is why I felt like Paul, uh, Timothy may have been dealing with some stuff because Paul reminds him to stir up that gift that God has given in him because it says this in verse number seven, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind, all available through the cross. God's not given you a spirit of fear, but of power. The notes say it could be said the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, the notes say that this uh, says a spirit of self-control, but you know, a sound mind says a lot. You know, a sound mind is peace. You know, if I'm not in a quandary, if I'm not back and forth, flipping and flopping, then, you know, that's a sound mind. Be thou therefore, be not, excuse me, thou therefore uh, ashamed of the testimony of, of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. The notes say that it actually means to take one share of ill treatment, which will always be accompanied by the power of God, which gives us grace to stand the test. You know, there, as a Christian, there are going to be mistreatments. As a Christian, there, you know, we're going to be treated wrongly. People are not going to believe us. They are going to... I say make fun, it makes it sound kind of, you know, whatever, childish, but it, it can hurt, you know. But the scripture says, Paul says to Timothy, be a partaker of the afflictions of God, of the gospel, according to the power of God. Amen. When we're attacked because of our faith, the power of God works in us. To cause us to cause our faith to be more firm, to cause our faith to be more steadfast, to be established. One of the one of the passages says in, in what we've studied. That's why we need a comforter. That's what that's one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to be a comforter. And when we have our faith, when we're living for Him, when Jesus Christ is our Savior again, I said a while ago that the Holy Spirit lives in us, and He will be our comforter when we are attacked. Uh, goes on to say, who has saved us what he, through what Christ did on the cross and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. None of what we do, none of how we live, none of how victorious we are or how sinless we are or any of this is by our own works. I was not called to be a teacher because of my own works. It's all by the grace of God. It says, but according to His own purpose and grace. We weren't saved for ourselves. Exactly. Come here. You wanna, you wanna. He said we weren't saved for ourselves. We were saved for Him. We were saved for Him. We were saved. The, part of this passage goes on to talk about uh, Timothy preaching and bestowing, you know, giving the message to others. And then those others would receive that message and pass it on. That's why we were saved. Yes, right. Not so we could sit in a little corner by ourselves and say, Oh, I'm going to heaven. Yay, yay, yay. I was saved so that other people could be saved. So that I could affect, affect, affect the lives of other people around me. That's why I was saved. Not so I could just be saved. That's all wonderful and great. Now, yeah, I'm on my way to heaven and that's great. But if I don't touch the life of anybody else, anybody else around me, I'm kind of not doing the will of God. You got me stirred up. Okay. Well, well, good. You got me stirred up. You know, we have... We have Oh, sorry. Here. Thank you. I'll just hold it. Um, for the past 40 years, I've been saved 41 years, but for the past 40 years, mainly what I've heard taught is a self-serving gospel. It's a bless me gospel. It's all about me. It's all about me getting a blessing. Me, me, God turning around my finances. You know, it's all about, it's all centered about, you know, the purpose for God saving me was all about me. And, you know, it's the prosperity gospel. 
you know uh, and I believe in healing and I believe in prosperity I believe in the blessings of God but that's not the main reason God saved me and that's not the main reason God saved you we were saved for his plan and for his purpose we were saved to be sons we're saved to, to man be the manifestation of the sons of God we're, we're saved to shine we're, we're saved to, to live and become love and show people what Jesus when they look at us they ought to see Jesus when they see us, they ought to see the Son of God. When they, when they leave our presence, they ought to say, hey, I've been with Jesus, you know, filled with love and becoming love, and, and he talks about that, you know. And what Paul laid his hands on Timothy for was to be filled with the Holy Ghost and for Christ, you know, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what it's all about. And the other things, full barns and overflowing vats and multiplying gold and silver and all that stuff, that's fringe benefits if they come. But that is not the most important things. It's, you know, when I lay in bed at night now, before I go to sleep, I'm like, Lord, may I please affect somebody in my life for eternity. May my life have an eternal effect on people around me. Live your life through me. Because that's the very most important thing. And the only thing the gospel is really about. It, uh, the scripture does say in there, but according to his own purpose. Right. And it, his own purpose is the salvation of, of sinners. That's what his purpose is. But now, is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death not talking about the physical death, talking about the spiritual death. The wages of sin is death. That death is hellfire and damnation. But Jesus coming abolished that death. He paid the price. And he's brought to life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher. Paul, and said, Paul said, this is why I'm a preacher. This is why I preach, because God has called me to spread the gospel to, to, uh, for the salvation of others so that life and immortality can be brought to life through that gospel. That's why I'm called a preacher, he said. That's why I believe anybody should be called a preacher. Or is, if they're called by God, that's the only reason they're called by God to be a preacher. Uh, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Paul preached to the Jews also, but his major thrust was to the Gentiles. For the which calls, I also suffer these things. Paul said, this is why I'm in prison. Because I preach the word of God uncompromisingly. He said, this is why I'm here. But then he goes on to say, nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And that's what we have to stand on. No matter what comes, no matter what happens, do you know whom you have believed? That's why prayer is so important. Because if we don't have a prayer life, if we, don't have, if we don't know the word, we don't know whom we have believed. We know about Jesus. We know what other people tell us about Jesus. We know what Pastor and Sister Allen and Jerry and all of them say about Jesus when we're here. But if we don't have a relationship with him, then I can't be like Paul and say, I know whom I have believed. That's why Paul didn't worry about being in prison. That's why he could say, I count it all joy. Because he knew who he believed. And the, it goes on to say, And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I, which I have committed unto him against that day. He was talking about his, his soul. He said, I know whom I have believed. And it doesn't matter what anybody else does to me. It doesn't matter how many times they put me in prison. It doesn't matter how many times they try to stone me. It doesn't matter how many times they beat me. It doesn't matter what they take away from me. It doesn't matter if I live on bread and water for the rest of my days. I know whom I have believed. And I know that I have committed the most important part of my body, of my life to him. And he's able to keep it. That's why he could count it all joy. 
That's why he could say, looking not, looking not at, at this, but looking ahead for, at the prize. I'm not quoting it correctly, I know. But that's why Paul and the others could say, I don't, I don't, I'm not worried about this present. That's why we should be able to say, it don't matter that I don't have any money in the bank this week. It don't matter that my best friend turned their back on me because I live for Jesus. It don't matter that my husband or wife or kids have decided they don't want to have anything else to do with me anymore. I know whom I have believed. And the most important part of, important part of who I am is committed to Him. And I know He's able to keep it. That's the most important part. Ma'am? He's, and he is committed to us. That's right. I committed to him, but you know what? The, 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 I was reading somewhere, and it may be in this, I think it's the next chapter. Uh, but uh, it is. Verse number 13, and I'm not going to do a lot. It says, it's talking about, uh, he said, It's a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, in other words, if we don't remain faithful, the scripture says, yet he abides faithful because he cannot deny himself. If I'm committed to him, he's a hundred times more committed to me because he cannot deny himself. Even when I'm not faithful, he can't deny himself. He's going to be faithful. So if I commit my soul into Him, you can rest assured He's able to keep it. Amen. Against that day is talking about His return and the, the, I'm sure the second, I mean there's a lot going in there that I didn't study and I don't know all the, the little things. So, you know, that's your source right there or over there, you know. Not, who? Okay, that she said, I don't know all about eschatology, and apparently I don't because I don't know what eschatology is. So you're completely right in that sense. Okay, but, you know, I, I do know, this is what I do know, that no matter what the day is, he's committed. And if I commit my soul to him, he's got it. Right here in the palm of his hand, and the only way I can leave is to jump out. It's the only way. The uh, Noah, in the midst of all the storms and everything that Noah went through, if he fell, he fell in the ark. Yes. Yes. Amen. And Jesus is a type of ark. That's, right. That's what that ark was pointing to, was Jesus. Yes. And when Noah fell, he fell in the ark. He didn't fall out of the ark. That's right. He was still in safety. Yes. He was still in the hand of God. I fall sometimes, but I'm falling in the ark. Because when I fall, I get back up and I say, God, I'm sorry, I messed up. But I'm still looking to you. I'm still depending on you. Hold fast. Hold fast the form of sound words. This is the, uh, the doctrine of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Hold fast. Those are two very important words. Amen. Hold it fast. Don't let it go. Keep a hold of it. Don't let anybody shake your faith. Don't let your kids shake your faith. Don't let your husband shake your faith. Don't let your wife shake your faith. Don't let your job shake your faith. Don't let your faith be shaken. Fight the good fight of faith. Hold fast to those form, that form of sound words. Hold fast. We hold fast to so much junk. You know, we hold fast to, oh, I gotta hang on to this money, or I gotta hang on to this belief, or I gotta, whatever it may be. Hold fast to the form of sound words. The sound words are Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Hold fast to that. Come what may. If the storms of life are knocking you to and fro, hold fast. 
Hold fast to the form of sound words. Amen. I'm going to stop there because I don't have time to go any further. But I, 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 want, that's where, I think that's where we need to end. Is hold fast Absolutely. to Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Yes. Absolutely. Thank Praise you. God.